I want to talk about, um, uh, as, as, as Dan said, why altering consciousness can have cognitive and sapiential effects. I do work on the nature of cognition and consciousness, and um, I think one way to add to what's going on in this conference is to talk about what we are coming to think about uh, consciousness and how that might help inform our understanding of altered states of consciousness. First, I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging work I've done with other people. Uh, a, a lot of this was based on work I did on relevance realization with Blake Richards uh, and Tim Lillicrap in 2012. Work with Leo Ferraro in 2013, uh, also something I should have put in there also in 2016. Current work with Leo, work I'm doing with Anderson Todd and Richard Wu. Uh, we've presented a poster, an abstract, and things like that on consciousness. Some past work with Zach Irving and Leo Ferraro, and also some inspiration from Dan himself. Um, I was this talk because of uh, some papers, two papers he wrote in two different courses for me uh, that connected some of my ideas to uh, psilocybin and uh, other such things. And I thought, ah, that's cool. And I like cool, so I thought I'd do this. <laughs> All right. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to talk about what, uh, what's consciousness for. Because although you love your consciousness, it's not really clear that it does anything. <laughs> I mean, it really, seriously. It's not clear. In fact, it's a really hard problem to, to, to determine what consciousness does, what's it for. We're going to take a look at two of the biggest or most popular theories about what, it, what's it, what it's for, what it does, global workspace theory and uh, the frontal parietal theory. And I'm going to show you how both of those point to the fact that the primary job of consciousness seems to be something like relevance realization. I could also make that argument for two other theories, uh, Tononi's uh, integrated information theory and Clearman's radical plasticity hypothesis theory, but I don't have time. But there is going to be uh, a publication on that. <clears throat> then I want to talk about what relevance realization is and what is so important. I know that's a shocker for many of you uh, that I'm going to talk about that, but I am going to talk about it. And then I want to talk about something uh, that's a little bit more new in that work. What are the connections between relevance realization, intelligence, and consciousness? And then I want to talk about how that might be implemented in the brain, some of the evidence that's coming in, in terms of the firing and the wiring of the brain. And I want to talk about relevance realization and self-organizing criticality and small world network formation in the brain. And, and, and talk about it in terms of uh, bioeconomically constrained complexification. Some of these terms don't mean anything to you right now. That's the point of the talk, of course. <laughs> right? And then the part you're really wanting to hear about, um, uh, connections between uh, psilocybin, LSD mystical experiences, and the complexification of cognition through altered states of consciousness. And I'm going to try and make a specific, more specific argument how altered states of consciousness have the potential to enhance openness, as Anderson mentioned earlier, uh, insight, the grasping of significance, uh, enhanced relevance realization, better perspectival knowing. And this is a constellation of features that we usually associate with a person becoming wiser. So that's how I'm going to get to that connection. As you can see, it's not a direct connection. Although the traditions like to make a direct connection between altered states of consciousness and wisdom, actually making a scientific case for it, a plausible case that could open up lines of empirical investigation, turns out to be a little tricky. But I think doable. Okay, so what's the global workspace theory? The global workspace theory is the idea that your consciousness is like a workspace, like your desktop on your computer. The idea is most of your processing is going on unconsciously, and what happens is, and that's like most of the files in your computer are not currently active, and then what you can do is you can activate them, you can bring the information into uh, your desk desktop, and you can have that information active, it can interact with other active information, and then it can be broadcast back to any and all the files you want it to. And so the idea is that's what your consciousness is doing. It's basically acting like that workspace that the rest of the unconscious processors can feed into so that information can be uh, activated, transformed, integrated, differentiated, whatnot, and then broadcast back to the unconscious processors. Now what's interesting, and whether or not this theory turns out to be true, there's, there's a lot of good evidence that there's something like this going on. <clears throat> but what I'm more interested in is a more recent paper. Bars is the, um, is the creator of the global workspace theory, but in 2005, Shanahan and Bars uh, published a paper specifically arguing what the function of the workspace is. And the workspace functions to solve what is called the frame problem. Now, the frame problem is a tricky problem in artificial intelligence, and it breaks down into two parts. 
And why Shanahan is relevant is he's the person who solved the first part and then wrote about the second part that remains to be solved. The first part of the frame problem is a very technical problem about how to get a logic that will represent change without screwing up your computer and you screwing up your AI. That turned out to be a hard problem, but Shanahan sort of basically solved it. What's left is the problem that he calls the relevance problem, the relevant, what I often call the relevance realization problem. Um, that has to do with side issues about why I don't think you can have a theory of relevance per se. I won't get into that today. What Shanahan means is this problem. Out of all of the information available to you, how do you zero in on the relevant information both in the external environment, all of the information available to you from your long-term memory, and how do you get them together so that they're relevant to each other and relevant to the particular context and situation that you're facing. This turns out to be one of the hardest problems uh, that we are trying to solve in work on artificial intelligence. A related theory, another neuroscientific theory, is the theory of Bohr and Seth. It's called their frontal parietal theory of consciousness. And they say something similar about the function of consciousness, but they're more specific. They say that consciousness is about chunking and working memory. Now, first of all, before I go on, I want to point out that that's already a significant overlap, and I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more, in that uh, Bars himself admits that there's a lot of overlap between his idea of the global workspace and psychology's idea of working memory. Working memory is basically what you can hold active in your mind. It's a place where you manipulate information, and you can see why that overlaps with the global workspace idea. They're, they're very, very similar ideas. It's not even clear if they're distinct and different. We don't need to decide that right now. All I need to show you is how integrated they are. Now, what's this idea about what is chunking? Well, ultimately, chunking is about relevance realization, and it's relevance realization that's designed to get information through the working memory bottleneck. The problem with your working memory is it can't hold very much. So if I give you these, right, and I say, look at that, you know, for about five seconds or so, and tell me what the letters were. You'll go, you'll do a few of them. Okay, then we'll go here, right. Now, tell me what the letters were. And you can do a lot more. Okay? Because what you've done is you found how the pieces of information are relevant to each other, and how they're relevant to you. And so what you do is you, if you chunk information, you're doing relevance realization in order to get information from the world through that bottleneck of working memory. Because working memory can't really hold too much in it at a time. Now, what's come out, and some um, really important work here done, in fact, at the University of Toronto by Lynn Hasher, right? is that we've gone from thinking of working memory as just a limited holding space, like kind of like a counter where you can just stack a few things. And what's replacing it is a model that working memory is actually a relevance filter. That what working memory does is actually filter information for how relevant it is. And that explains why chunking information gets it through working memory. Because what working memory is basically filtering for is how much has the information been processed for relevance. The more relevance processing you do, the better it goes through working memory. And that's not a mystery anymore if you start to think of working memory as a relevance filter. Now, what I want to suggest to you is, right, if you put those things together, consciousness is a relevance filter. Right now, your consciousness is doing that for you. It's generating what Ramachandran and others and work I'm doing with uh, Richard and Anderson, what we call the salience landscape. It's giving your perspectival knowing. So what do I mean by that? Perspectival knowing is, the propositional knowing is when you know facts, like that Australia is a continent. And procedural knowing is when you know how to do something, like catch a baseball. Perspectival knowing is knowing what it's like to be something, like knowing what it's like to be thirsty. What's it like to be thirsty? That's not having a bunch of facts in your head. It's not exercising a set of skills. It's having a particular salience landscape. When you're thirsty, right, things that might lead to water start to jump out at you. Start to, right, start to matter to you, start to grab your attention, start to arouse your energy. And what happens is you get this whole projected salience landscape. Now the thing is, you're not doing that only when you're thirsty, you're doing it right now. You're doing something that what, uh, what Mateson called in 1976, sizing up. It's a very complex and recursive and self-organizing form of relevance realization. So out of all the things in the environment, you're picking some out as relevant features to pay attention to. And then some of those features, perhaps features associated with me, are being foregrounded. I hope I'm being foregrounded right now. Right? 
and some are being backgrounded. And then of the ones that are foregrounded, they're being, being configured together. And then of the things that are being configured together, you're formulating problems. Perhaps the problem you're formulating right now is trying to follow what I'm saying. <laughs> okay? Now, you're doing that all the time. This is happening all around you. This really recursive, complex relevance realization is creating this textured, dynamic, flowing, salience landscape in which you are exercising perspectival knowing. And, is, and that is this complex way in which consciousness is sizing up situations and filtering information for its relevance. And what it's doing, right, is allowing you to zero in on the relevant information that you need. Now, it's not doing that flawlessly, because you can't do that flawlessly. But it's doing it in a very effective manner. What do I mean by that? Well, if we take a look at... Uh, what's going on in relevance realization, we can see how central it is to your ability to solve your problems. And I would argue that that is how we have come to understand what intelligence is. It's your general capacity to be a general problem solver, to solve many problems in many different domains. In order to point that out, I could do this with other phenomena. I've done it in publication. I've done it in other talks. I could talk about similarity. I could talk about categorization, etc. I'm just going to talk about problem solving because that's the one that's most sort of apparent to people in its connections to intelligence. And there's three things I want to talk about there. The search space model and combinatorial explosion, the real world of ill-defined problems, and the need for insight. Okay, so the search space model comes out of Newell and Simon, and what they did is they formalized and analyzed what problems are. So you start a problem as you have some representation of a goal state. My goal state is to uh, get through this talk before collapsing. <laughs> and I have some initial state, right, that I'm in. And then I can do operations that will transform that initial state into other states, and so on and so forth. And a problem solution is any series of transformations that will turn the initial state into the goal state, while obeying certain kinds of path constraints. And a problem solving technique is a technique for searching through that space and finding one of those pathways. And the problem with that diagram, of course, is that it's very misleading. First of all, it's actually not as comprehensive as it should be, but what's more importantly misleading about it is it's presented to you from the God's point of view, God's eye point of view. So you can see the whole space at once, and you can see which of the pathways lead. Of course, in real life, you're not there. Real life, you're here, looking this way, and you don't know which of all of these alternative pathways is going to get you from your initial state to the goal state. And that turns out to be a really deep problem and it's a problem that's very deep, but your brain is so devoted to dealing with this that most of the time it's not coming into your conscious awareness. Right? It's what consciousness is at least contributing to doing for you. Now let me show you some numbers about this, these search spaces. F to the D is the size of any one of those search spaces. F is the number of operators, and D is the number of steps. So let's take, this is an example from Keith Holyoke, a famous example. Let's take an average chess game. On average, there's 30 legal moves on any given turn, and there's an average of 60 turns. So the number of alternative pathways is 30 to the power of 60, or 4.239 times 10 to the 88. Now that's a big number. You'd like to have that much money. Okay. Now, what you may say is, but the brain is a marvelous machine. Yes. Okay. It's, and people will say, it's the most complex thing in the universe. First of all, that's logically false, because the brain plus anything else is more complex. <laughs> okay. That's not, but people say it's really complex. And what they mean is that there's lots of neurons, right? Uh, so 10 to the 10 is the approximate number of neurons you have in the human brain. That's really dwarfed by the size of the search space. We say it's not the number of neurons, it's the number of synaptic connections. I've done some neuroscience, yes. And the number of synaptic connections is five times 10 to the 14, which is still astronomically too small to, to search that search space. In fact, the total number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 82. So it's a, it's a tough problem even for the universe in one sense. Now, before I go on, think about this. Somehow, you don't do that. You have to not search most of that space. And yet, you somehow 
often find solutions in many different kinds of problems. It sounds like a Zen koan. By being ignorant of most of what you should look at, you become intelligent. <laughs> okay? Now, the answer that Newell and Simon gave, and let me be clear about this because sometimes people have misunderstood me. The answer that Newell and Simon gave is the distinction between heuristics and algorithm. I'm going to use it in the technical sense they used it, not well, how the word algorithm is now generally meaning any sort of uh, machine learning principle. An algorithm is a problem-solving technique that is designed to uh, guarantee getting you an answer or prove that one's false. So it works in terms of certainty, like logic and math, right? Instead, a heuristic is a problem-solving technique that is designed to improve the probability of you solving your problems. Um, and what it does is it tries to pre-specify where in the search space you should look. So let me make that concrete. If you're playing chess, you have certain heuristics for playing, like get your queen out early, control the center board, things like that. Now the thing about a heuristic is although it can improve your chance of winning, it, right, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to win. Now, turn that around, there's an opposite side to it. right? An algorithm guarantees solving your problem, and often the only way you can guarantee solving a problem is to, solve, is to search the entire search space, which you can't do. It is combinatorially explosive. Now that means something important. It means that your cognition cannot be comprehensively mathematical, logical, or use the formal principles of probability comprehensively, because that would be cognitive suicide. So most of your cognition has to run heuristically. It has to use these things that bias what, where, where you're going to search in this space. Now the problem is, Heuristics are insufficient alone, and that's because there's no final definition of relevance, because nothing is intrinsically relevant. Right? And so when we talk about this in literature, we often pair the two terms together, heuristic and biases. If you go back to the chess example. You're playing chess heuristically, so you're biased to pay attention to the center board, and your opponent notices that and uses the peripheral board to defeat you. This happens to you in your own cognition. I said a moment ago, using the formal principles of probability is not something you can do in most real-world situations. It would be combinatorially explosive. So your brain uses heuristics to estimate probability. It uses a representative heuristic, which is how much something stands out in your mind is how probable it is. And it also uses the availability heuristic. How easy you can imagine an event or remember such event, the more probable it is. So you do this kind of thing. We all do it. I did it not that long ago. You take your friend to the airport, and then you, will use, you use all this code language for don't die. You say, text me when you're there, have a safe trip. You know, you're basically saying over and over again, please don't die, I love you, don't die. Right? Because you're thinking plane crash, and that's super salient, and you can remember one because when they happen, they're advertised on the news, and blah, and then they get on this airplane, and then you turn around without a second thought and get in your death machine to go home, <laughs> called an automobile. Okay? So heuristics are very important. They're a necessary part of your intelligence, but they're not sufficient. Heuristics depend on something else in order to help compensate for that biasing effect and help them to function more effectively. And this has to do on your problem formulation, how you've basically set up your problem, how you have right, represented, in some sense, the initial state, the goal state, the path constraints, etc. <clears throat> now, problem formulation is, in that sense, essential to being a problem solver. In problem formulation, we zero in on the relevant information and avoid combinatorial explosion. Now, problem formulation also turns out to be really important for another aspect of things. The real world of ill-defined problems. See, there's actually sort of two broad kinds of problems, and your education misled you about their relative importance and frequency in the world. A lot of your education was designed, was involved giving you well-defined problems. A well-defined problem is when there's a clear goal state, there's a clear initial state, there's a clear set of operators. An ill-defined problem is a murky goal state, an unclear initial state, an unspecified set of operators. So, I take it for the... For most of you, the top problem is a well-defined problem. You can tell me what kind of problem it is, right? What kind of problem is it? Multiplication. And that tells you immediately what kind of operators are relevant, what kinds of things you can do. And you know a lot of things. You don't even consider. Is singing relevant? No. Okay. 
You know what the goal state is. It's going to be a number. It's going to be bigger than the other numbers, right? It's very well defined for you. And you were given lots of these, and that's important. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But it masks a certain fact that lots of problems that you face, lots of real-world problems, are ill-defined problems. So one I often point out to my students when I'm talking about this in a lecture is the problem of taking good notes. What's the initial state? I don't have good notes. <laughs> not, not, not very helpful. What should the final state look be like? Well, good notes. And what do you have to do to give good notes? And then they'll give me lots of synonyms for relevance realization. I have to zero in on the relevant information. I have to pay attention to the crucial information. I have to connect the information in the ways that's important and valuable. All they say again and again and again are synonyms for relevance realization, relevance realization, relevance realization. Participate in the conversation. That's actually a very ill-defined problem. Say stuff. What? Porcupine table. No, okay, that's not it. Okay, so, right, and you have to say it at the right time, in the right way, right? Give a good talk. That's a very ill-defined problem, and I'm facing it right now. <laughs> My prototypical example of the ill-defined problem is uh, one that's had to occur to me twice in my life. Um, I had to go back twice in my life into uh, the wonderful world of dating, which I don't find to be either a world or wonderful. Um, <laughs> although, it, I mean, I met a wonderful person in it, um, so I shouldn't be that uh, negative. What I mean is, you can tell that uh, a first date is an ill-defined problem because of the advice your friends give you. Ask questions, but not too many. <laughs> Be funny, but not too much. Look at her, but not too often. And then you realize the whole point of the advice is so that they can say later, no matter what happens, I told you so. <laughs> Which might be malicious, or it might be that they're trying to create with you the pretense that there is some way of bringing certainty out of this very ill-defined problem. Now, most real-world problems are ill-defined. And what you have to do in an ill-defined problem is you have to create a good problem formulation by doing lots of relevance realization. So problem formulations, once they exist, help you avoid combinatorial explosion. And very often you have to create good problem formulations in order to turn ill-defined problems into well-defined problems. I want to tell you, talk a little bit more about that power of problem formulation, show it to you, and then show you also why you need insight. So this comes from work done by Kaplan and Simon and others. This is called the mutilated chessboard problem. Okay, so you've seen a chessboard before, right? I hope so. Okay, so how many little squares are there? There's eight columns, eight rows, so there's what? Okay, that's not the problem yet. Okay, so I have a domino, and vertically or horizontally, it will cover two squares, and you know that because the chessboard is a square. So how many dominoes do I need to cover the chessboard? 32. So far, so good, right? It's all very happy. Now I mutilate the chessboard. See, I remove those two corner pieces. So I have 62 squares left. Now, can I cover that with 31 dominoes without overhang or overlap? And you're not allowed to guess. So it means you can give me a proof, right? OK, so this has been studied a lot. And so I'm confident in what I'm going to say, that this is what most of you are doing. You have formulated this as a covering problem. You're trying to imagine in your mind various configurations of dominoes on the surface of that mutilated chessboard and see if you can make it work. Now think about the number of dominoes, think about the number of spaces. That turns out to be a combinatorially explosive way of formulating the problem. Famously, there was a person who was skilled in math who had formulated it as a covering problem, and he filled like 63 pages of a Hillroy notebook over 10 hours trying to solve the problem that way. You can't solve it that way. You don't have enough time. It's not a good way to spend your life. <laughs> now, what if I point out to you that no matter how I put a domino on the chessboard, it has to cover a black and a white square. Yes? Right. So what, do I, what must I have in order to be able to cover it with dominoes? An equal number of black and white? Do you notice anything? Ah! They're both white. And notice what you did. Ah, that weird primate noise that we use to signify insight. Insight is when you have realized that you have a poor problem formulation, you have broken that frame, and you have reframed it with an effective problem formulation. So one of the things relevance realization does is it actually feeds back on itself. You do relevance realization in problem formulation, 
but you can also step back and do relevance realization on your problem formulations in insight. Insight is a way in which your relevance realization processes are self-correcting and self-transcending. Okay, so problem formulation helps to avoid combinatorial explosion. Problem formulation turns ill-defined problems into well-defined problems. Problem formulation is central to problem solving and it implements relevance realization. Problem formulation is an integral part of sizing up situations and forming a salience landscape. Insofar as consciousness is helping you size up situations and create the salience landscape within which you can do your problem formulation, it is integral to you being able to do a lot of problem solving. So that means to the degree to which problem solving is dependent on problem formulation and problem formulation is dependent on sizing up and projecting a salience landscape. Intelligence and consciousness are deeply linked. And since we do think that intelligence has a job, well, that means that we're starting to find perhaps what consciousness job is. Now Stanovich, in, in a whole in a slew of experiments and articles, him and his uh, uh, colleagues and protégés over decades, a recent book, for example, uh, What Intelligence Test Miss, has basically come to the conclusion that what we're measuring when we psychometrically measure intelligence is the ability to deal with what he calls computational limitations. Or to the terms we've been using in, the, in this talk, intelligence is your ability to avoid combinatorial explosion. It's your ability to do relevance realization. Now notice some things we've already mentioned. Working memory, right, we've talked about, is a relevance filter. And intelligence is relevance realization. So we should find that there should be a high predictive relationship between measures of working memory and measures of your general intelligence. And guess what? That is, in fact, the case. So there's connections between consciousness and working memory. Connections between working memory and intelligence. Connections between intelligence and relevance realization. Connections between working memory and relevance realization. Connections between consciousness and relevance realization. Consciousness between, connections between relevance realization and problem solving. Connections between consciousness and problem solving. Many people are arguing that what you need consciousness for are ill-defined problems. Problems with high novelty, complexity, or some combination. And of course, there's important connections, as I said, between problem solving and intelligence. That's a massive convergence argument. So, I did some work with Leo Ferraro, he's a professional uh, psychometrist, he, he, he measures uh, IQ, right? And we took a look at the, the measures for general intelligence, and this was in an article we published, so I'm just quickly going over it, you can see the argument and the evidence in more detail, right? But all of these things, there's problem formulation, there's solving all defined problems, a couple of other ones, right, you've heard me mention, and the argument we basically made is, when people in psychometric and uh, when they're talking about their measures for general intelligence, they talk about these things, but people in cog sci, when they're talking about relevance realization, are talking about exactly the same thing. Problem formulation, solving, all so what we're testing for, basically, psychometrically, is we're testing for abilities at relevance realization. We're testing a few other things, raw working memory capacity, vocabulary, but this is the core of a lot of the things, and it may be the core that actually causes the manifold of G, for those of you who know a little bit about this stuff. For those of you who don't, forget it. We'll just go on. It's irrelevant to you. <laughs> okay, so what are some of the other things that we are now measuring that are highly correlated to our measures, our psychometric measures of general intelligence? Well, here's one that's really interesting. I'll have to teach you a little bit, some of you along the way. Okay, so you have network theory. Network theory studies how things are connected. Airlines, social systems, and kinship structures. But you can also study how neurons are connected in the brain. Now there's three basic types of network. So the one on your far left is called a regular network. The one on the far right is a random or chaotic network. And the one in the middle is called a small world network. It's based on the Disney song, A Small World After All, which proves academics need to get out more. Okay? <laughs> Now, the thing you should know is your brain is telling you the opposite about what's actually the case. The most you measure the efficiency of this network by the average distance between any two points. The, the most efficient network is actually that one. Right? The most inefficient is the one on the far left. Now, what the one on the far left has going for it is it's a very resilient network. 
right? You can, you can take out pieces, you can lose connections, and it can still function. It can, it can redesign itself, it can repair itself, it can readjust itself. This one is low in resiliency and high in efficiency. That's because efficiency and resiliency are in a trade-off relationship with each other. Now, the one in the middle optimizes for efficiency and resiliency. It has almost as much efficiency as the random and almost as much resiliency as the regular. Right? Now, the more, this, this was work done by Langer et al. in 2012, the more your brain is wired like a small world network, the higher your general intelligence measures. So it looks like what a brain is doing in order to realize relevance is it's trying to optimize the relationship between being efficient and being resilient in its processing. So efficiency, right, we, I've just talked about efficiency, the brain is trying to get as much as it can for expending as little, to, as little of its metabolic processing and temporal resources. Resiliency, resiliency is actually really long term or developmental efficiency, but instead of saying efficiency and efficiency, which would be confusing, we say efficiency and resiliency. Now you need resiliency because you need reserve for repair, you need re rewiring, you need sources of new design, right? <clears throat> so, for example, if you look at Darwinian evolution, it trades between these two things. Natural selection pairs things off in terms of their efficiency, but mutation and other things create resiliency in this system by increasing the variation. And it oscillates between the two, and that's how it's constantly adapting, right, organisms to the environment. <clears throat> so, there you have this opponent processing constantly going on between efficiency and resiliency. They're in a trade-off relationship. You can see that. There's other versions of this that are talked about in the literature. This is also in the trade-off between stability and plasticity. Everybody says, I want, they heard of, the people have heard about plasticity. The brain can redesign itself and I want more plasticity. Mm, sort of, no, not too much. Because if you're too plastic, you don't, you don't have any stability, which means you don't learn, which means you don't transfer from one situation to another. You don't generalize. Now, if you have too little plasticity, you will overgeneralize. And I can't, and nobody can give you the algorithmic solution to that because there isn't one. There's a proof for this called the no free lunch theorem, and I'm not going to go into that right now. Okay, another more important one is the generalization discrimination problem. Do you want to generalize? Well, that means you pay more and more attention, you consider more and more relevant the similarities between things. But perhaps you want to discriminate. And in that situation, the differences between things are more relevant to you. And there's a constant trade-off between those. Now, you, do if, if you, you get efficiency by basically doing data compression. Data compression is like when you have a scatter plot, you do the line of best fit that allows you to interpolate and extrapolate. It allows you to generalize your, re, your results. Resiliency you do with, with data particularization. Basically, you, you get a function that it fits more specifically to your data sample and it specializes your processor, and it will differentiate, it'll give you different functions. So, the brain would presumably be training between compression and particularization. Now, I want to point out to you that efficiency and resiliency are bioeconomic constraints. They're working at the level of economic principles, the bioeconomical principles of your brain. That, it's, it's a more, as Anderson was saying, this is a more basic level. This is lower, much lower than your level at w of your everyday consciousness and cognition, the level at which you're using representations. Representations presuppose relevance realization for their very existence because they're aspectual in nature. When you represent something, you're only picking up some of its features that you consider relevant, how they're relevant to each other, and how they're relevant to you. You can't get relevance realization out of the representational level because it requires relevance realization. That means, right, that all of this level is a level, the level of your experience is a level above it. So, the brain would be implementing relevance realization by doing opponent processing between compression versus particularization. You can make a good case, and some people have, that that maps onto the Piagetian categories of assimilation and accommodation, for those of you who know his theory of development although it allows you much more mathematical, uh, precise models than he had. 
if you, if you like Dan Siegel's model of development, it maps on to integration versus differentiation. Now the important thing is when you have a self-organized relationship between integration and differentiation, your system is complexifying. So think about it as a biological example. You started out as a zygote and you couldn't attend a lecture or a conference. So what happens is two things. The cells start to differentiate, right, into different kinds of cells, but they literally self-organize and integrate into specific organs. And that, that right, that double track of integration and differentiation creates a complex system. And complex systems have emergent functions. Because, because they're differentiated, they can do more things, but because they're integrated, they hang together as a system. So complexification gives you emergent abilities, emergent functions. So complexification is how a system can produce emergent functions and thereby transcend itself as a system. When I have a suspicion, and I argue this in a course I teach on Buddhism and cognitive science and uh, responding to the meaning crisis in Western civilization, that this, this self-transcending aspect of relevance realization, which is so fundamental, which is lower than our ego and more fundamental than this ordered world of experience, maybe that is the root of our spirituality. Maybe the meaning we're talking about is that kind of connectedness that is self-organizing and precedes us at least in terms of our egoic existence, and yet has always within it a capacity for self-transcendence. Well, that would be another talk. Okay. Anyways, complexification is central to qualitative development. Qualitative development is not just a change in how much you know, it's a change in what you're competent to know, what kinds of things you can know. So, that's, right, important aspect of this whole thing. Now, if we take a look at relevance realization, we can take a look at it not only how in the brain is wiring together, connecting and making networks, we can take a look at how the brain is firing. And you can see this compression and particularization in the brain. Basically, when neurons fire in synchrony, they're doing something like data compression. And then when they fire asynchronously, it's called a neural avalanche, they're breaking that functioning up and they're allowing differentiation and particularization of functioning to happen. And what the brain is doing is constantly oscillating between synchronized and asynchronized firing. And it's doing that at all levels of analysis in your brain. Very, very micro levels all the way up to the whole level of your brain. Self-organizing criticality is going on. So self-organizing criticality is also implementing the trade-off between efficiency and resiliency by implementing the trade-off between compression and particularization. Which would mean, if it's implementing RR, and RR is intelligent, then there should be a predictive relationship between self-organizing criticality and measures of intelligence. And that has been found. The more flexible your brain is in self-organizing criticality, the more intelligent you are. That's been found. Why is it called self-organizing criticality? Because the system is always poised, it's always, it, it, it integrates and then it disintegrates and then reintegrates and disintegrates. Okay, what have we got to? Small world network wiring and self-organizing criticality, firing, they mutually reinforce each other. The more you fire in a sock fashion, the more you will wire as a small world network. The more you're wired as a small world network, the more you will fire in a self-organized critical fashion. They each support each other and both are strongly correlated with measures of general intelligence. But here's the thing. Small world network formation is also highly associated with consciousness. So Monty et al, for example, in 2013 did experiments where you use propofol, which is a general anesthetic, to induce a loss of consciousness. And then you do dense EEG to see what's happening. And then you can also, people recover consciousness as they come out of the general anesthetic and you can see what's happening. Basically, as you pass into unconsciousness, your brain moves from being a right, small world network into a bunch of local networks. And then as you come back into consciousness, it rewires back up as a small world network. Consciousness and complexification are deeply interrelated because consciousness is doing relevance realization. Self-organizing criticality is also associated with consciousness. Cosme et al. did work with, in, and this, this is ongoing, these are only exemplary, they're not exclusive experiments, 
on binocular rivalry and what they called waves of consciousness, which sounds like a 68 rock group, right? <laughs> waves of consciousness. <laughs> Basically, in binocular rivalry, you have two stimuli that can't be seen at the same time because they contrast and compete with each other, and you put them into field of vision. And what your brain does in perception is it constantly flips. You'll see one, and then you'll see the other, and then you'll see one, you'll see the other. It's kind of like a variation on the Necker cube. And what you can do is track how the brain is firing what's doing that. And that coming in, in and out of consciousness, the waves of consciousness tr are tracked by waves of self-organizing criticality. Why? Because consciousness is doing relevance realization. Interestingly enough, both se uh, self-organizing criticality, work done by Stefan and Dixon, and Small World Network, work done by Schilling, say that Right? Both of these have a lot to do with insight problem solving. Okay? So, you knew I had to do it. So here's the nine dot problem. It's one of the hardest insight problems there is. You have to join all nine dots with four straight lines. You have to start the previous line from the terminus. So you have to start the next line from the terminus of the previous line and people think it's initially easy and they try and they try and then it's very hard. In fact, it's statistically non-distinguishable from zero. And here's the solution. And when you do that, people say you cheated. <laughs> what had to change was, right, was your salience landscape. What, ha what ha had to happen is the way you formulated the problem, think about self-organizing criticality, had to break up, and then in a, in a self-organizing fashion, it had to reconfigure what you consider salient and relevant so that you can then solve the problem. It's highly plausible that insight is when self-organizing criticality, the way the brain is firing, causes the formation of a small world network. So, right, if, you, if the firing causes one of those long distance connections to form that creates a small world network, that's plausible what insight is. And think about what's happening in insight. Insight, we, we represent it with a flash, like a light bulb. Insight represents like a flash in consciousness. It's about a moment of super salience, a moment of deep, real, you know, deep realization of what's relevant, of grasping the patterns in order to solve the problem. I'll try to show you how in insight, problem solving and consciousness and the self-organizing process we're talking about are all found in a co-present manner. How might that then bear upon our understanding of altered states of consciousness? Okay, so Anderson alluded to this earlier in his talk. There's work at the Griffith Lab showing that mystical experiences, not all aspects of the psychedelic experience, but mystical experiences induced by psilocybin are deeply significant. People will consistently rate them as their most significant events in their life. Right? They represent some deep realization of what's relevant and important. Deep relevance realization. These events can re result in long-lasting changes to the personality feature of openness, which, as Anderson mentioned, is not supposed to be changeable. In fact, openness does slightly change over time. As you get older, it goes down. You become crotchety. <laughs> openness is your willingness to Explore. It's a degree to which you drive your own problem solving, entertain new ideas, new experiences. I think that Jordan Peterson and Colin DeYoung, right, have made a very good case that openness is what they call motivated cognitive flexibility. That the system generate is it's pushing its own cognitive flexibility. And cognitive flexibility is the ability that is the most predictive of your capacity for insight. So what's happening is this psilocybin seems to be opening up your cognitive flexibility, enhancing your insight. That suggests that it's somehow enhancing your relevance realization ability. And that could make sense, because if consciousness is about relevance realization and mystical experiences represent an altered state of consciousness, perhaps those are altered states of consciousness that are actually the enhancement of your relevance realization abilities. So think about it. Mystical experience is typified by an experience of realization about a profoundly integrative insight. And that would, of course, represent enhanced relevance realization. Goodman, in 2002, argued, I think quite well, that 
what LSD does is alter how awareness normally functions to what he calls filtering uh, information, right? And he says LSD works to open this filter. He also argues that it's plausibly what is happening in mystical experience, that they're both opening the filter. Plausibly, this is also the case for the mystical experiences that occur within psilocybin. What's happening is it's opening the relevance realization filter. Really comprehensively altering your capacity to generate a salient landscape, your perspectival knowing. So I'm suggesting to you, I'm not claiming that this has been established. I'm trying to show you that we've got converging lines of argument and evidence that make a plausible line of empirical investigation now possible. Which is a good case for changing our policy around these things, right? <laughs> so, psilocybin is altering and perhaps enhancing how consciousness does relevance realization. Now, this is some of the work that Dan put me on, and it's really cool work. Read it. You will be better. <laughs> okay? Recent work by Carhart Harris and colleagues, 2014, 2015, 2016, it's becoming a factory. Like, it's really, really impressive. Has provided evidence that psilocybin increases the flexibility and resilience of the brain by right, increasing the repertoire, this is almost a direct quote, of the brain's dynamical states. You increase the resiliency. But, but, psilocybin also increases the overall functional connectivity and efficiency of the brain. So it's pushing on both sides of relevance realization. It's increasing the resiliency, but increasing the efficiency. It's driving complexification. It's going to, and as it does that, it's going to enhance capacities for insight. She, in fact, specifically argues that it probably pushes the brain into a state of criticality. Like in self-organized criticality. That's exactly what she's talking about. In other words, as I said, psilocybin drives the brain to complexify. And probably, probably, or at least plausibly, or at least worthy of good empirical investigation, this has to do with small world network formation, and with increased self-organizing criticality, as she herself argues. All of that would enhance your relevance realization capacities. What I'm suggesting to you is psilocybin induces, psilocybin induced mystical experiences probably reflect enhanced relevance realization because we have good reason to believe that it's enhancing the machinery of relevance realization. So look at what we're getting here. We're getting an increase in openness, an increase in insight, an increase in perspectival knowing, right? Because of the capacity to transform your salience landscape in powerful and new ways. You have the, the ability to grasp and experience significance. All of this through the enhancement of relevance realization. So that would bring many of the cognitive features associated with wisdom. Those are a lot of the features we use to describe wise people. I know this because I also do work on the psychology and the neuroscience, the cognitive science of wisdom. One that I didn't talk about too much, although it's in here, is this perspectival flexibility. And we talked about perspectival knowing. That enhanced perspectival flexibility would be an integral part of wisdom. Because perspectival flexibility is what allows you to overcome egocentrism. It allows you to internalize other people's perspectives on your perspective, so you can take a perspective on your perspective. This is one of the most powerful ways in which you can overcome your own biases and overcome your own tendencies towards self-deception. Of course, it also enhances empathy. And an empathetic and compassionate understanding of other people is often regarded as integral to being wise. The set of cognitive changes in psilocybin-induced mystical experiences could form the basis for sapiential, which just means wisdom, wisdom-like, homo sapiens, man the wise, right? sapiential effects in development. 
It could drive the complexification of cognition and could result in the emergence of a new set of functions in a coordinated fashion that we tend to call wisdom. Now, let's be careful what I'm not saying. I'm not saying every psychedelic experience is going to do this. I was being very specific here in what I was looking at. I gave a, a related talk long, not that long ago in Mind Matters when I talked about when you mess around with your salience landscape, you also open yourself up to the machinery of self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. So we should be making sure that we are tailoring our altered states of consciousness so that they are wisdom enhancing rather than self-deception enhancing. Well, one of the things you want to do is you want to, right, situate, right, these practices within communities where people are being taught other types of skills, mindfulness skills, skills of rationality and reflection, skills of overcoming e egocentrism, what a mystical experience is as opposed to a psychedelic experience. And that's not hard to do. Griffith teaches his participants in the experiment how to distinguish between those. What we need is what we've lost, which are wisdom institutions and wisdom communities. You know where to go for information. The internet. You know where to go for knowledge. Universities. Where do you go for wisdom? <laughs> so, the point I'm making is that there is a tremendous potential here for something that we really need. Our culture is going through a meaning crisis and a wisdom famine. There is plausible argumentation and evidence that properly and responsibly used things like psilocybin could provide us reliable means for the cultivation of wisdom and the re-enhancement of our sense of meaning and connectedness. I'm trying to make an argument for how and why we should change things, because that's what this bloody conference is about, right? As some of you know, I mean, I think the meaning crisis problem, this, right, we, meaning is a, is a metaphor. We're, 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 lives don't literally have meanings because lives aren't sentences. We're using a metaphor. And what we're talking about is we're talking about a sense of connectedness to ourselves, to each other, to the reality, and a sense of connectedness that reliably affords our growth into wisdom and compassion. That's what we're hungry for. This could help. There's good reason and evidence to believe that it could. If this argument is correct, then the, cont the content of our, 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 our experiences may not be as central as we seem to believe. We have tended to focus on the strange phenomenology and the bizarre beliefs that come out of these experiences. We have tended to try to model these experiences in terms of the knowledge they provide. I think that's problematic. I think instead these experiences might reflect a developmental change in our processing. I mean, this may sound counterintuitive, but I think what's important about these experiences is not what's happening in the experience, but how you are changed after them. Arthur Dykeman said this a long time ago. Ultimately, it's not about altered states of consciousness, it's about altered traits of character. I think mystical experiences may not be so much about their content knowledge, but rather they may be more about their processing wisdom. So not only am I giving an argument as to why and how we could engage in more research and, and why we should, I'm also suggesting that we reformulate what we are considering salient and important as we do this research, because that may afford some fundamental insight into this machinery that we are so sorely lacking and in need of in our society today.
Thank you very much for your time.